The fifth plenary meeting is called to order. Please, colleagues, take your seats. Good morning, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues. The meeting will now resume its consideration of agenda item eight, entitled Organization of Work. Uh, delegations will recall that at its fourth meeting yesterday afternoon, the meeting concluded the consideration of sub-items E and F of agenda item 11. Accordingly, after our initial consideration of agenda item 15 this morning, we will proceed directly to consideration of sub-items G and I, uh, G1 of agenda item 11. Should we conclude the business scheduled for this morning before one, we will proceed with sub-item G3 of agenda item 11. May I take it that it's the wish of the meeting to proceed accordingly? Thank you. The meeting has thus concluded its consideration of agenda item 8 for now. It is so decided. The meeting will now consider agenda item 15, entitled consideration of the adoption of the final report of the meeting. I now give the floor to the Secretary General for a brief update. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Just a very brief announcement to say that there are, uh, as was uh, advised to states, parties and signatories last night, uh, there are now two new documents on the website. Uh, they are TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP6, decisions to be taken by the first meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP7, the draft Vienna Action Plan. I also want to take this opportunity to remind all media in the room that they are required to stand on the stage at the back of the room and not to roam around the room. Thank you very much. I thank the Secretary General for this update. Delegations have before them the draft report of the meeting contained in document TPNW slash MSP slash 2002 slash L1. We will return to this item at the end of this afternoon's session, but I wanted to give uh, delegations an update on the um, Vienna Declaration, the draft Vienna Declaration. I wanted to thank uh, um, all delegations uh, who have approached us to express uh, support for this uh, document. There remains some work to be done, um, so some further consultations are necessary, and I will keep uh, the meeting uh, updated on this. So as we're going to take up the final report uh, later today, for the moment, the meeting has thus concluded its consideration of agenda item 15. The next agenda item would be item 11G1. Yesterday evening, the, sec the Secretariat circulated conference room paper CRP6, entitled Decisions to be Taken by the First Meeting of States Parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and I trust the delegations have had the opportunity to review its contents. The meeting will now consider this item entitled Other Matters Important for Achieving the Objectives and Purpose of the Treaty, such as institutionalizing scientific and technical advice for the effective implementation of the Treaty of Agenda Item 11, entitled Consideration of the Status and Operation of the Treaty and Other Matters um, for Achieving the Objectives and the Purpose of the Treaty. So delegations have before them working paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash working paper six, entitled Institutionalizing Scientific and Technical Advice for Effective Implementation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was submitted by the President-designate following 
consultations with states parties. Let me briefly introduce this paper and the rationale uh, behind establishing a scientific advisory group. Uh, and I want to really thank uh, all delegations uh, that took part so actively in the many consultations that we had. The scientific and technical knowledge of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and an understanding of their risks uh, were a key motivation behind the TPNW and followed the examples of other disarmament bodies. Um, the working paper represents the result of an open and comprehensive consultation process and institutionalizing scientific and technical advice for the effective implementation of the treaty and further enriching uh, the knowledge will remain a priority for states parties. So once again, thank you all for the active engagement. The establishment of a scientific advisory group will include the following benefits. It will be the access to updated scientific and technical advice will be secured and will facilitate the decision-making process. The understanding of scientific and technical challenges in effectively implementing the treaty will be further developed. Advice on various issues, among others the implementation, positive obligations, scope and technical standards for the irreversible nuclear weapons program elimination and disarmament verification approaches will be provided and scientific attention on humanitarian consequences and risks will be kept and will also contribute to the wider disarmament and non-proliferation discourse. The decisions to be taken for the establishment of a scientific advisory group were circulated in uh, uh, the conference room document 6. I'm also informed by the Secretariat that it has to date received two nominations for the Scientific Advisory Group. I would now like to open the floor for delegations um, if they have comments on this agenda item. Ah, sorry, I already have some requests for the floor. I give the floor to the, de to the delegation of Malaysia to, to be followed by South Africa. Malaysia, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Malaysia fully believes that the TPNW is legally sound, feasible to implement, and reflects the legal norm that nuclear weapons are categorically unacceptable. It is essential that efforts to achieve the objectives and purpose of the treaty are firmly and accurately grounded in the latest scientific findings and technological developments institutionalizing scientific and technical advice in the workings of the treaty will help advance its effective implementation and strengthen the credibility of the process. Mr. President, Malaysia notes that the scientific advisory group may potentially be tasked to provide reports on latest developments in relevant scientific and technical fields to the MSPs and review conferences of the TPNW support capacity building through engagement with states, parties, scientists, academia, and civil society organizations, and also provide scientific and technical advice on matters relating to the humanitarian consequences of and risks associated with nuclear weapons and related humanitarian response challenges. Noting the importance of these tasks, Malaysia believes that the SAG must then be expert-driven, impartial, and independent, and that the members are considered and selected in an open and transparent process. These elements are crucial in ensuring the competence and effectiveness of the group, and also to ensure that their input will be objectively considered by all states' parties to the TPNW. The establishment of a mechanism such as this is not new. Precedents include the Scientific Advisory Board of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, which is a subsidiary body tasked to render specialized advice in science and technology to the governing body and states parties to the CWC. Taking cognizance of the experience of others, we would be able to adopt and adapt 
best practices most suited to the requirements of the scientific advisory group so central to the success of the TPNW. We are heartened to see that there is already strong support and interest for the participation and membership in the scientific advisory group. In this regard, Malaysia is also considering how we could best contribute to this process, including through the possible nomination of candidates from our cadre of scientific experts. We look forward to fully engaging in the process of establishing the scientific advisory group for the TPNW. I thank you. I, I thank the delegation of Malaysia for this statement and I'll give the floor to South Africa to be followed by Mexico. Thank you, Mr. President. The concerns that we have with regards to the risk of nuclear weapons has been with us for close to eight decades. Our understanding of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons and the catastrophic consequences continues to be better understood through informed scientific and technical knowledge. Further enriching our knowledge and understanding of the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons also yeah. supports our outreach and universalization efforts. Scientific advice would also support other aspects related to the TPNW, such as the competent international authority and deadlines or deadline extensions under Article 4. Mr. President, in terms of the nomination of experts for the scientific advisory group, South Africa had proposed that states' parties be given 90 days after this meeting to provide their nominations, uh, also to be consistent with other nominations. This is in view of the congested disarmament calendar and the need to engage national stakeholders as well as securing, where necessary, authorization of nominated experts following this meeting of states' parties. And this would also provide an opportunity to get a sufficient number of nominations. The scientific advisory group could subsequently convene its first uh, constitutive uh, meeting as soon as possible after the appointment by the president. We welcome that our proposals were taken into consideration in the draft decisions circulated overnight. Uh, Mr. President, we look forward to fully engaging on this issue uh, as we move forward towards uh, the second uh, meeting of states parties. Thank you. I thank the delegation of South Africa. And I now give the floor to Mexico. Mexico thanks the presidency for the process under this agenda item. We support measures to establish the scientific advisory group and hopes that this group can be sustained in order, and equally that we strike a gender and geographic balance in the composition of its membership. Thank you very much. I thank the delegation of Mexico and I'll give the floor to Princeton University to be followed by the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Princeton University, please. Thank you. I am Zia Min from the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was arrived at through sustained diplomatic and civil society processes focused on understanding the terrible and enduring humanitarian impacts of the testing and the use of nuclear weapons and of the continuing dangers today to people and planet of the possession and the threat of use of nuclear weapons. The survivors bear witness to the traumatic experiences of the many harms of the nuclear age, the central role of scientists in causing this harm through developing, building, testing, maintaining, and modernizing nuclear weapons is well known and cannot be denied. But throughout the nuclear age, scientists also have sought to use their training and knowledge to help explain nuclear dangers and to help chart a path to nuclear disarmament. In 1946, as we all know, the United Nations called for a plan for the elimination of nuclear weapons in that same year, Albert Einstein announced the formation of an emergency committee of atomic scientists. The goal of this group was to educate and mobilize other scientists, the public and the governments of the world on the dangers to humankind of the nuclear weapons developed by the United States and used to destroy two Japanese cities. 
The Emergency Committee offered advice to the world on the need for and the path towards disarmament. It helped pioneer the study of the verification of nuclear disarmament through international inspections. It also argued for scientists playing a key role in monitoring the compliance with disarmament obligations of their own governments. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, thousands of scientists, led by chemistry Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, provided technical support to the public's desire to end atmospheric nuclear testing and its associated global radioactive fallout. This effort helped enable the limited test ban treaty. Pauling was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. In the Cold War, the Pugwash conferences on science and world affairs worked to bring scientists together from around the world to find ways to reduce and to end the role of nuclear weapons in international politics. Pugwash and its co-founder, Joseph Rotblat, a physicist, were awarded the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize. Many of us know how important has been the work of scientists in recent decades in explaining the damage from even a single nuclear explosion and the catastrophe that would be nuclear war. The current status of this work was discussed at the humanitarian conference on Monday. Some here will remember that in 2017, during the TPNW negotiations, scientists were invited to speak to the conference to support states in their deliberations on the treaty. During this first meeting of states parties, there have been references to the continuing need for a strong scientific and technical basis for treaty implementation. A formal scientific and technical advisory process established by this meeting can play a useful role in supporting states parties to meet their implementation goals and in helping building legitimacy around the implementation process. The president's paper lays out the benefits of establishing a scientific advisory group for the treaty. The president's paper recognizes in particular that science constantly advances. I have no doubt there will be new developments in scientific and technical fields relevant to the treaty, its goals, objectives, and implementation in many of its most important aspects. The state's parties may find it of value to have available to them advice from scientists who are committed to supporting the TPNW. The choice is yours. If states' parties decide to call upon like-minded scientists for advice and assistance in this great shared endeavor to lift the nuclear shadow over humankind, you will find many who stand ready. Thank you. I thank uh, Princeton University for this statement. I give the floor first to the delegation of Cuba and then uh, followed by the international physicians. Uh, Cuba, you have the floor, please. Gracias, señor thank you very much, President. We would like to thank Austria for facilitating these consultations on the working paper on institutionalizing scientific and technical advice for the effective implementation of the treaty. As has been underscored throughout the consultation process, the issues to be addressed by the group need to be defined by the state's parties. Among the themes to be addressed, the following should be included. Dismantlement of nuclear weapons, options and approaches for verification of nuclear disarmament, options for the elimination of plutonium at large scale, technical standards for irreversible for verification of irreversible dismantlement of nuclear programs for military purposes and scientific and technical methods in order to support the implementation of the positive obligations under the treaty. During the intercessional period, the, uh, effort, the focus should be on the rules of the working group. The role of the working group defining its functions and its membership, all of which should be reviewed by the second meeting of states' parties. Regarding the membership of the scientific technical advisory group, in the working paper, the recommendation is made that the working group comprise a maximum of 15 members designated by the president-designate of the uh, meeting of states' parties in consultation with the states' parties. We would request further clarification as to how this will take place in practice. How will this consultation 
take place with the state's parties. We believe this is most important in order to guarantee transparency of the process. A question, for instance, will all states' parties receive the full list of all candidates to be nominated by states' parties to be members of this group, including their nationalities and their curriculum vitae? A further question. Will the state's parties have the right to object to the designation of specific candidates for membership of the group? Finally, we would be grateful for further clarification outlining the consultation process with state's parties. Finally, we believe that the reports issued by the group of experts should duly reflect the different positions adopted within the group in the absence of a consensus on all or specific issues within the group. Thank you. I thank the delegation of uh, Cuba for this statement. I give the floor to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Carlos Humana, and I am co-president of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and a member of ICANN. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of a proposed scientific advisory panel. At the ICANN Civil Society Forum this past weekend, we heard graphic testimony from victims of the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and from those who suffered radiation exposure during the testing and production of the vast nuclear arsenals that the nine nuclear armed states have built up in the years since. We also heard vivid descriptions from the medical community of the catastrophic direct effects that these larger and more deadly weapons will have if they are used today. And we heard the assessment of the ICRC that no significant medical response is possible if these weapons are used. At the Humanitarian Impacts Conference on Monday, we heard powerful presentations from climate scientists about new evidence indicating that the climate disruption that will be caused by even a limited nuclear war is far worse than previously thought and the resulting famine will be far more catastrophic than previously predicted. Taken together, these warnings about the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons are the most compelling reason for eliminating nuclear weapons and the most powerful argument we have for the need to universalize the TPNW. The TPNW is the product of evidence-based policymaking. It is the result of policymakers listening to the evidence presented in three international conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and taking action. The political action materialized in the process leading to the negotiations of the treaty. The evidentiary support must continue to be associated to the TPNW and to all efforts leading to its universalization. Therefore, we believe that it is critical to create an advisory panel of medical and scientific experts on the humanitarian consequences and risks associated to nuclear weapons and the requisite humanitarian response. This is necessary to ensure that adequate and irrefutable evidence prevails in all efforts associated to the TPNW and the stigmatization of nuclear weapons and to assure that new data on the consequences of nuclear war are brought to the attention of member states and aid them in outreach efforts to the states yet to join the TPNW. Evidence is the foundation of the TPNW. The evidence of the horrific effects that nuclear weapons have caused and can cause, the evidence of the existential threat that the current nuclear arsenals represent to humanity, and the evidence of the close calls and near misses lead to the inevitable conclusion that disarmament is necessary and urgent. Thus, Establishing the mechanisms for legitimizing the urgent need for nuclear disarmament through evidence should be prioritized in this meeting. Thank you. I thank the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War for this statement. Is there any other request for the floor? If not, I wanted to respond uh, to the questions raised by the delegation of Cuba. Uh, the intention would be, of course, that uh, states parties would receive uh, all nominations uh, and uh, CVs, uh, that the 
president would consult uh, with states parties on a uh, composition of the group in line with the general principles of ge geographical representation uh, that uh, um, there would have to be an agreement. So um, that implies that states parties have the right to object. And that in terms of uh, working together, the intention was that the scientific uh, advisory group would work in the spirit of scientific cooperation, uh, so not in a, not in a uh, overly formalized way. But if it's the wish for the delegation of Cuba, we could add to the sub-item I the word comprehensive before report, if that is uh, something that, uh, that uh, uh, clarifies the issue further for the delegation of Cuba. I see the delegation of Cuba nodding for the for the benefit of all uh, states parties we would in the decisions uh, paper CRP 6 on page 2 sub item I we would add after the words the scientific advisory group will provide a and then we, we would add the word comprehensive report on its annual activities for to the president for circulation among states parties this is supposed to reflect the understanding that uh, uh, all the views uh, would be um, reported. I give the floor to the delegation of Cuba. Thank you very much, President. First and foremost, the Cuban delegation would like to thank you for the clarification regarding this recommendation. We're also grateful for the specific proposal that has been made for amending the language that you've just presented. As we see it, this will contribute by enhancing the clarity of the text. It's very important for Cuba to have the certainty and understanding of how this process of consultations with states parties is going to take place as regards the establishment of this scientific advisory group given the relevance that this advisory group is going to have. Now, I have no additional wording proposal to suggest, but I would like to use this opportunity in order to state duly for the record our interpretation, Cuba's interpretation of how this process of consultation with states parties regarding membership of the advisory group will take place. And I will read out now three points which underpin our interpretation of this consultation process. First of all, our understanding, our interpretation is that all states parties will receive information regarding all nominated candidates, information which should naturally include the name of the nominee, the name of the candidate, their nationality, and their curriculum vitae. Secondly, we understand that once the president presents his her proposal to states parties, regarding the proposed membership of this expert group, we understand, and as you clarified just a few minutes ago to us, we understand that any state party has the right to object to any of the nominees that the state deems relevant. Third point, in our interpretation, we understand that the president will have the prerogative to nominate or designate a number of up to 15 members of this group 
It is, however, unclear, or at least we are not told here, what the minimum number of members of the group would be. As we see it, at least theoretically, that would mean that the group could consist of between 12, between 2 and 15 members. And as such, we believe that a number less than 10 would not be sufficient to guarantee adequate geographic distribution, representation of different experience, expertise within such a group. And therefore, while I am not about to submit a proposal for an amendment, I wish to state for the record our interpretation as follows, that this scientific advisory group should not consist of fewer than 10 members. Thank you very much. I thank the delegation of uh, Cuba for this statement uh, and for the interpretation. Uh, first, a question from my part. Would Cuba still uh, wish to have the inclusion of the word comprehensive in the place that, yes? Okay. In terms of the uh, minimum number, I take it that uh, Cuba uh, understands this to be 10. We were looking at the rules of procedure, the um, sub I, uh, rule 37, where the, uh, so, sorry, rule 47, where for subsidiary bodies, a majority of members of the bureau, uh, 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 that uh, it would require a quorum, which would be 50 plus. So we interpreted it as a minimum of eight. But of course, if you, uh, if the delegation of Cuba wants to fix it to be to be 10, that is uh, also possible. We were looking at uh, uh, rule 46, uh, rule 47 as the explanation, which meant uh, um, if the if if it's up to 15 and the quorum would constitute eight. So everything above eight, we considered as a quorum. Um, I don't know if that explanation is satisfactory to uh, Cuba or if you. Uh, insist on the number 10 as the understanding. Can I give the floor back to the delegation of Cuba? Thank you very much, President. Perhaps an error in the interpretation. First of all, let me make it clear that I'm not proposing any change to the language as proposed. I'm not making a proposal for an amendment. We agree that the number of members of the advisory group should be a maximum of 15. We agree with that. What I'm saying is that this paragraph doesn't establish a minimum number. It only establishes a maximum number, which could mean that in theory, the president may decide that that group consists of just two members. And so, what I'm saying is that, in our opinion, if the language is not changed, the president should not appoint fewer than 10 members. That means that our expectation is that the president will nominate a group with a membership of between 10 and 15, between 10 and 15, but never less than 10, and never more than 15. That's our interpretation as regards the composition of the group. Thank you. I thank the delegation of uh, Cuba for this uh, um, statement and uh, uh, this understanding. Um, with these explanations and clarifications, um, Conference room paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP6 entitled Decisions 
to be taken by the first meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons contains draft decisions on the institutionalization of scientific and technical advice for the effective implementation of the treaty, which we have just orally amended to include the word comprehensive in sub-item I. Um, section one of the conference paper contains draft decisions, which I've just said, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, may I take it that it's the wish of the meeting uh, to adopt the draft decision contained in section one of conference room paper uh, TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP6 as orally amended. It is so decided. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a, a very important deliverable for this meeting. Uh, I wanted to thank all delegations for the support from the beginning of uh, the idea of establishing such a group. I do believe, uh, and I think uh, 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 all of us believe that it can be a very significant contribution for the implementation of the TPNW. Uh, we are establishing something new. Uh, delegations will recall that uh, uh, the invitation to um, uh, send expressions of interest for nominations was already sent in May. Um, on the basis of which so far two uh, nominations have been received. I wanted to reiterate the call um, to states parties to nominate uh, qualified candidates. Uh, the deadline to do this has now been extended to 90 days. But of course, uh, um, I think all of us are keen to start with the implementation uh, as soon as possible. So thank you all very much for this important decision. Uh, and uh, um, I think this is an important uh, positive um, step that we have taken. May I take it it's the wish of the meeting to conclude its consideration of sub-item G1 of agenda item 11. I see no objection. It is so decided. Meeting will now the meeting will now consider sub-item G2, entitled Other Matters Important for Achieving the Objectives and Purpose of the Treaty, such as Intercessional Structure for the Implementation of the Treaty, and Agenda Item 11, entitled Consideration of the Status and Operation of the Treaty, and Other Matters Important for Achieving the Objectives and Purpose of the Treaty. Delegations have before them working paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 working paper 8, which uh, I submitted following consultations um, with states parties, and I have the pleasure to introduce this working paper. I would like to thank uh, all of you once again for your very active engagement during the consultations on this paper. The effective implementation of the treaty will require continuous efforts by states parties. Hence, it's important to develop an efficient and effective structure for the intercessional work between meetings of states parties and the lead up to review conferences that best facilitates the implementation needs of the treaty. And already several substantive work strands have been developed through consultations and working papers. Drawing up on these different work strands, the ambition was to develop a coherent intercessional structure that is workable, resource appropriate, recognizes the capacity of states parties and the resources of states parties, and that is effective for current implementation requirements, specifically in the early phase of the treaty. This is a, a, a need for flexibility, again, in this early phase of treaty implementation, 
was also something that was highlighted particularly during the elaboration of the paper. So for our young treaty with limited human and financial resources, it requires a flexible and effective structure as outlined in working paper eight. The structure includes the establishment of a coordination committee and informal working groups on positive obligations on Article 4 and on universalization. And as the paper highlights, it's important to keep uh, a level of flexibility, particularly during the early implementation phase, in order to be able to respond to different requirements um, or circumstances. Any decisions on the intersessional structure taken at the first meeting of states parties is, of course, without prejudice to subsequent adaptation and changes. We also establish a focal point on gender and we also appoint uh, informal facilitators on complementarity, uh, which have been included in the um, conference room paper, um, which is conference room paper number six, wasn't it? Yeah, conference room paper number six that was uh, distributed to states parties. So with this brief introduction, let me thank all again for the um, excellent cooperation and input that we received in the consultation process. And I have requests for the floor from South Africa to be followed by Cuba. South Africa, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In an effort to ensure the operational implementation of the TPNW, the organizational structure that we agree to will have to effectively bring together all of the working groups in a manner that is inclusive, state party driven, workable, flexible, and resource appropriate. In view of the role played by specialized agencies and civil society in the TPNW, it would be useful to leverage the involvement in a supportive role of relevant UN agencies, the ICRC and ICANN. Mr. President, South Africa proposes that the next president of the meeting of states parties should assume his or her responsibilities at the close of this MSP, at which his or her uh, country is elected. This ensures that the presidential prerogative and space is accorded to a president to assume full responsi responsibility to organize and prepare for a meeting of states parties as soon as uh, it is elected by the states parties to do so. In this regard, South Africa calls for the deletion of paragraph 2B under the section in intersessional structure. Mr. President, the inclusivity of the organizational structure is paramount for South Africa. It is for this reason that we wanted the United Nations in New York to be uh, specially mentioned as the venue for in-person or hybrid meetings. The preference for the UN in New York is based on the fact that it has the highest number of permanent missions, particularly from developing uh, states parties. We trust that these points will be reflected in the decision on the intersessional organizational structure. Thank you. I thank the delegation of South, South Africa for this statement. I give the floor now to Cuba. Muchas gracias, señor. Thank you very much, President. President, we would like to thank Austria uh, for facilitating the consultations on the intersessional structure. We believe that the establishment of an intersessional structure, an appropriate intersessional structure at this first stage of implementation of the treaty, will be fundamental for its future institutionalization. The intersessional structure should be reasonable which means, first and foremost, taking into account the real capacities of states' parties, in particular, though developing states' parties with limited financial and human resources, in order to adequately cover the meetings to be planned by the various working groups. There cannot be a boundless proliferation of the number of meetings or of the organization of simultaneous meetings held by the different working groups. 
the participation of other stakeholders alongside states' parties at the meetings to be held during the intercessional period should correspond to what was agreed upon in the rules of procedure. Recalling that the treaty as yet does not have a high number of parties and that financial resources are scant, we would believe it wise for at the time being at least to ensure that the meetings of the working groups held in this first inter intercessional period to be informal and without financial obligations for these states' parties wherever possible. Appropriate rotation in the posts of co-facilitators of the working groups must also be ensured, always bearing in mind the principle of geographic, equitable geographic distribution. And equally, we believe that any recommendation or understanding developed within a working group is always subject to subsequent changes, consideration and final decisions to be reached at the meetings of states parties or at the review conferences. These bodies must be the only mandated bodies to adopt decisions. The decisions that are adopted at this first meeting of states parties of the TPNW regarding the intercessional structure should not prejudice subsequent or possible adjustments or modifications to these decisions in the future until the end of the institutionalization process of the treaty. I thank the delegation of uh, Cuba for this statement. Yes, the um, consciousness about financial resources was one of the uh, key uh, aspects when we developed, uh, when this paper was developed. And uh, uh, so is the geographical uh, representation of uh, um, states' parties that take up responsibilities. And of course, informal working groups uh, develop recommendations for consideration uh, by states' parties at meeting of states' parties. I have to apologize that in the introduction, I of course made a significant omission. First of all, I forgot to express my gratitude to Ambassador Duncan of New Zealand, who uh, helped as friend of the President to develop uh, this proposal. In particular, um, uh, uh, when it comes to identifying uh, uh, a group of states parties that are ready to take up responsibilities, uh, which have now been included for consideration of states parties in this document. Uh, we have um, uh, the informal working group on universalization uh, to be chaired by South Africa and Malaysia, informal working group on victim assistance, environmental remediation, international cooperation and assistance to be co-chaired by Kazakhstan and Kiribati, the informal working group on, uh, on the implementation of Article 4, uh, of Article 4, in particular work related to the future des designation of a competent authority or authorities. And this group will be co-chaired by um, Mexico and New Zealand. In addition, there is one change which I omitted to highlight in sub-point K, uh, the appointment of the informal facilitator to explore and articulate possible area for tangible cooperation between the, the uh, TPNW the NPT and other relevant nuclear disarmament instruments. We have in the document, uh, you have in the document before you uh, the appointment of Ireland, which would be joined by Thailand, so we would have co-informal facilitators on this issue. And finally, um, the delegation of, of uh, Chile has, uh, has, uh, 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 is, is, uh, is proposed uh, as the, um, to be appointed as a focal point on gender. So um, I wanted to reiterate the thanks to Ambassador Duncan and of course uh, on behalf of all of us uh, reiterate the thanks to the countries that have put themselves forward to take on responsibilities because of course in the initial phase of the treaty the implementation will be very much states parties driven, uh, states uh, ready to take on um, extra burden of work. So this is very much uh, welcomed. Um, do we have another request for the floor? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I have uh, 
Yes, ICANN is still on my list. I give the floor to ICANN, please. Thank you for giving me the floor to speak about intersessional structure for the implementation of the TPNW. We welcome the commitment of states to keep working on the implementation of the treaty intersessionally and recommend that the first meeting of states parties establish an intersessional structure of work, including the creation of informal working groups as well as a coordinating committee to coordinate the work of the working groups. We recommend that themes addressed by committees or coordinators should address at a minimum victim assistance, environmental coordination and international cooperation and assistance, as well as a universalization and implementation of Article 4. We recommend that intersessional meetings be open to all states, relevant international organizations and civil society. We encourage states to begin work during the intersessional period to develop guidelines for gender mainstreaming in international cooperation and assistance, taking into account relevant approaches in other humanitarian disarmament instruments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank ICANN for this statement. Uh, the delegation of Philippines has also requested the floor. No? Sorry. That must have been a misunderstanding. Is there any other delegation that wish to take the floor? I see none. I understand from the statement of the delegation of South Africa that South Africa requests the deletion of uh, in conference room CRP2 in the decision on the establishment, um, the sub item 2B. So we orally amend uh, this decision um, and did. I give the floor to the, to the delegation of Mexico. Thank you very much, President. We would like to thank the delegation of South Africa for the proposal made. The delegation of Mexico is of the view that this paragraph is seeking to engage in work in a cooperative, collaborative spirit between the chairs, as is the case in other bodies, in order to help work progress the preparatory work for the next meeting of states parties. Now, undoubtedly, it is quite often that you see two chairs or three chairs approach one another in order to help work progress, in order to equally ensure consistency or coherence overall. And I believe that is the spirit in which we have been working also on this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. In this regard, our delegation is of the view that this is a specific feature, an attribute of this body, of this treaty, namely to be able to continue working in a collaborative manner without this being uh, restricted to the mandates of each, chair, of each chairman or president, but rather being able to work progressively, constructively, in order to help build the institutionalization of the treaty in order to meet its purposes. I'm certain we could come up with alternative wording which might be acceptable to the delegation of South Africa, but as a matter of principle, we wish to state this for the room, that we would prefer to stick to this collaborative fashion. I thank uh, the delegation of Mexico. I give the floor to the delegation of so South Africa to be followed by Cuba. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and we'd also like to, to thank uh, Mexico for expressing the, the views and 
uh, highlighting the, the collaborative manner that uh, a presidency would uh, move forward uh, when taking over. Of course, uh, we have uh, no, uh, nothing against uh, having collaboration between uh, incoming and outgoing presidencies or even beyond that. Uh, our issue is, is not uh, one of uh, a problem with the collaboration, but it's formalizing the structure. Uh, in our view, per the presidential prerogative is, is quite important. Uh, and to formalize something right now, uh, when this treaty is still new, we're not sure how things are going to work out, is, is actually not needed. Uh, if there needs to be collaboration between Austria and Mexico, uh, we are fine with that, uh, and it can be an arrangement between, between both delegations. Uh, the, the wording, uh, we know that there's a footnote included, but the wording that's, that's placed under paragraph 2b uh, takes this beyond uh, the second MSP. Uh, that is a concern. That there shows an institutionalization of, of this process. We note in, in, in paragraph 2a, you talk about uh, this being for, for the intercessional period between uh, the first and second meetings of states parties. The footnote mentions that, but the wording of paragraph 2b goes beyond that. It talks about meetings of states parties and or review conferences. Uh, so in our view, we, we do not need this right now uh, at the moment. Uh, as I said, if there needs to be collaboration between uh, Austria and Mexico, that is fine, uh, but we do not need that put into a decision uh, that we have to walk back at a later stage. Uh, we know that there will be engagement uh, as we head towards uh, the second meeting of states parties to review the, the intercessional structure. Uh, however, uh, walking back issues is always a difficulty. Uh, again, reiterating, this is not a requirement for this intercessional structure to move forward. Thank you. I thank the delegation of South Africa. Uh, Cuba, please. So, thank you, Mr. President. I requested the floor to, to seek uh, clarification on, on the proposal of South Africa, but I think after the statement of my dear colleague from South Africa, it's pretty clear right now the reasons behind the proposal. So, I'm not going beyond that at this point. Thank you. I thank all delegations who have spoken on this issue. Um, after having worked extremely closely and well with Mexico on many issues in the disarmament and non-proliferation field over many years, I personally have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that uh, this will continue. I understand the um, concern expressed by uh, South Africa for not formalizing uh, this. Um, I would suggest to follow the proposal from South, South Africa and that uh, uh, the outgoing presidency and the incoming presidency will simply co cooperate well in the coordinating committee. If that is uh, uh, the wish of the de delegation of South Africa um, and unless Mexico insists on this Mexico. Thank you, President. If you could perhaps just give us a few minutes to uh, consult with the candidate for the for the chair. Thank you.
would like to suspend the meeting for uh, 10 minutes. Could the media please keep their place on the riser? If you do not, if, you, if I have to ask you to go back to the stand one more time, you will be escorted from the room by security. Please return to the riser.
Please take your seats. Please take your seats. The meeting is resumed. I understand that following consultations, I can give the floor to the delegation of South Africa. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, of course, following consultations between uh, the presidency, uh, Mexico, and ourselves, we have a, a proposal to, to put forward uh, to amend paragraph 2B of uh, the decision on the intercessional structure. Uh, the proposal reads as follows. In order to facilitate continuity in the implementation of the treaty and in the spirit of cooperation, the president of the first meeting of states parties will chair the coordination committee until the midway point between the first and second meetings of states parties, at which time the chair will be assumed by the president of the second meeting of states parties. Uh, Chair, that is the proposal uh, with the footnote that was previously included. Thank you. I thank the delegation of South Africa for this uh, statement, also the delegation of Mexico. Uh, we understand that this is now, that adds the precision that was uh, required for the delegation of South Africa, and uh, I hope that is also acceptable to all other states parties. With this um, clarifications, may I take it that it's the wish of the meeting, um, it's just all right. No. We will now take a decision on section two A to J plus L. Yeah. Section 2K will be taken up later during the consideration of sub item G3 of agenda item 3. Ah, the delegation of Jamaica. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, we are glad to see the spirit of compromise and flexibility um, in our process. Uh, just on that note, um, and to try to ensure that we have clarity and bear in mind the change that is now being proposed, uh, just a suggestion on um, paragraph A, which speaks to the composition of the coordinating committee. Um, the current wording has it comprising the outgoing president as well as the president of the subsequent meeting. And um, based on the fact that we will have already elected the president of the second meeting um, by the end of this meeting, it would be much clearer if it indicated that the committee comprises the president of the second meeting, uh, the president of the first meeting, and the co-chairs and so forth. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Jamaica for this proposal. Uh, Cuba, please. Thank you very much, President. The delegation of Cuba wishes to present three small proposals for this draft decision. Draft decision two. The first regarding paragraph A, which refers to the composition of the coordination committee. Our specific proposal as follows. In the in the eighth or ninth 
line after the word observers of the it's line nine after observers of the we would add the following phrase state parties de tal manera in so doing the text with our proposal would read as follows in english with the participation as observers of the interested states parties comma the international committee of the red cross and the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons y el resto de and the rest of the paragraph remains as it stands unchanged my second suggestion our second proposal relates to paragraph E, which lists the uh, co-chairs of each working group. In this paragraph, Chair President, we would like to indicate the following, that these co-chairs will function, will serve between the first meeting of states' parties and the second meeting of states' parties. In our opinion, it is at the second meeting of states' parties that the decision will be adopted regarding the subsequent chairs, which may be a decision to renew or extend the mandates of these chairs or, if so decided at the second meeting, to appoint new co-facilitators. And we're making this proposal as we believe it would be necessary to ensure an appropriate system of rotation which will allow for a distribution of responsibilities among states' parties. And then finally, a minor amendment to the following paragraph, which is paragraph F. In the sixth line of paragraph F, after the word co-chairs, we would propose adding the following. With states parties. Voy a leer. And I will read it. I will read the text as it would stand with our proposal, and I'll read it now in English. As well as other relevant stakeholders may be invited by the co-chairs in consultation with state parties to participate in the work of the informal working group as observers. And the rest of the paragraph will continue like, like it is right now. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you very much. I thank the delegation of Cuba for these proposals. I give the floor to the delegation of New Zealand. Mr. Mr. President, and, uh, and it's great to get feedback on the draft of the decisions that you, you tasked me with. So I wanted just to make a, a couple of comments. Uh, in relation to the first proposal put forward by the distinguished representative of Cuba, I'd be really interested to know if there are any precedents in other disarmament and arms control regimes whereby a coordinating committee, which of course has a mandate to report to all states' parties and receives reports from, in effect, open-ended informal working groups, which are open to all states' parties, whether there's any precedent in actually having a coordination committee in an intercessional period, for example, in the cluster munitions uh, or landmines convention, for example, because I think that would be a, an interesting fact to know. Uh, 
I have, um, I, I believe that the extra clarity that the distinguished representative of Cuba offered in relation to the appointment of the co-chairs at this stage, as well as, for example, the facilitator and gender focal point later, it was certainly my intention as your friend, Mr. President, to actually have these appointments strictly for the intersessional period in order to ensure that there is opportunity uh, for new states parties, for different states parties to share in the, uh, in the work and in the building of our treaty regime. So I think that's a, an excellent clarification and fully aligned with the uh, intention. And in relation to the, uh, to the third uh, the, uh, proposal made by our distinguished colleague from, uh, from Cuba, I don't think that I understand fully the additional benefit uh, that would come to the intersessional work program. And so if there's an elaboration in terms of what additional benefit is being sought with that proposal, I'd certainly be grateful to hear it. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, um, the delegation of New Zealand. Let me also um, uh, explain, since uh, this was, of course, initially a presidency paper, that uh, the intention in the early phase of the treaty to have extremely flexible uh, and, and, uh, and uh, um, mostly informal uh, processes. So I understand, of course, the delegation of Cuba wants to have clarity about what, uh, what they asked to being uh, uh, to agree to, but I would want to appeal to the sense that it's difficult to over-formalize an informal process. So there has to be um, a, a, a balance, at least that was the intention of, of, uh, of uh, how that was uh, um, put forward. It's of course not the intention to, to, um, uh, to uh, set up structures that take decisions. Um, uh, and of course the idea is the uh, delegation of New Zealand has just pointed out is that all the informal working groups uh, are of course open to all states parties but I recognize also the delegation of South Africa has taken the floor I'm sorry I've only just seen your name late please uh, thank you uh, mr. president uh, just to to remind you that there was a second proposal as well from South Africa and that was to formalize uh, the United Nations in New York as the venue uh, if there happens to be uh, in-person uh, meetings. Uh, in-person or, or hybrid meetings are mentioned in paragraph 2G and uh, 2J. Uh, so inclusion uh, of the venue would be appreciated for uh, sake of clarity. Uh, I don't think this is over formalizing it and uh, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, just on, on the uh, uh, proposals by Cuba, I, I also don't see that as over formalizing the, the process. It provides some clarity and we understand uh, the, the issues uh, raised by Cuba on this. Uh, thank you. I thank the delegation of South Africa. Cuba, please. Muchas gracias, señor. Thank you very much, President, and I apologize for taking the floor again, but I understand that the distinguished delegate of New Zealand would like to hear further explanations from us, perhaps, regarding our proposal for paragraph 2A, and of course I'm very pleased to provide that. As we see it, the main problem with paragraph 2A is that it only enables the rights of states as permanent observers for two organizations. The International Committee of the Red Cross and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Now we fully support the fact that these two organizations should be able to participate as observers in the Coordination Committee. And indeed, it seems to us that their contribution will be highly useful 
and we have absolutely no difficulty whatsoever with the granting of permanent observer status to these two organizations in the Coordination Committee. Now, my problem, Mr. President, what we cannot accept is that the state's parties had less of a right than two international organizations. And that is why we are making this proposal. If we are going to establish the status of permanent observer, and if we are going to grant this status to two international organizations, and let me repeat that Cuba fully supports this, well, then we feel that this status of permanent observer should also be open to states' parties, to interested state parties. And that's why we made our proposal. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Cuba for this clarification. Does any other delegation want to take the floor? Um, I see the delegation of Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to take the floor. Um, I just have a, a question for clarification on the proposal from South Africa uh, about naming New York as the uh, only location for any in-person meetings of the informal working groups or other meetings. Um, it, it seems to me, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the logic here in terms of limiting um, New York as the only venue for these discussions. I think the likelihood is, of course, that we will have many of these discussions in a hybrid manner or perhaps a fully virtual manner in the first instance. Um, but I, I think this might be limiting the flexibility um, of those working groups in a way that may have unintended consequences. Uh, I, I note South Africa is very keen, for instance, uh, to make sure that individual proposals here relate only to one MSP to two MSP. But if we were to set in stone forevermore that all informal working groups take place in New York, I think that could create some difficulties in the future. So I'd appreciate some additional clarifications on those issues. Thank you. I thank Ireland um, for this intervention. South Africa, please. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, of course, uh, thank uh, the delegation of Ireland for, for seeking clarity on this. Uh, just, just to be clear that uh, we're not trying to limit the organizers in any way, but we're trying to promote the participation by states' parties. And New York uh, has, has the most representative, uh, especially from, from, from uh, developing states, uh, that can participate in, in uh, meetings. Uh, if you look at, at the states' parties that we have uh, in the, in the uh, TPNW at the moment, uh, between the three UN venues, New York would have, uh, New York would be the venue that has the most uh, uh, representation. And therefore, uh, we do not want to limit states' parties by moving it uh, to any other country, not, not just a, a UN center. Uh, and thus uh, restrict participation in, in any way. Uh, our, our proposal is essentially meant to get as many states' parties as possible to meetings if they happen to be in person. Thank you. I don't see another request for the floor right now. I, it is my sense that uh, the delegation of Mexico, sorry. Thank you very much, President. First of all, I'd like to tell you that after the consultations we had, despite the fact that we've worked on the wording, we can go along with the suggestion to delete paragraph 2B, of course, in the understanding that we will continue working together in a cooperative and collaborative spirit with the presidency, with the previous and designated presidencies, 
that is the delegations of Austria and Kazakhstan. As regards this point, my delegation would tend to agree with the delegation of Ireland in that we should not necessarily restrict ourselves to one single place, one single meeting place where these meetings can be held. If undoubtedly New York is a location where this work can be undertaken, there may well be other areas too, given the geographic representation that is equally relevant in disarmament matters where states may also be able to organize meetings. And so our preference would be not to restrict this only to one single location. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Mexico. Is there another request for the floor? I think uh, I would propose that we defer the decision on this because there have been too many um, suggestions made. We will um, put something in writing and refer, um, uh, come back to this issue uh, in the early afternoon. I think that might be the best. Yes, and I would like to ask uh, those delegations that have made proposals to send them in writing to the Secretariat. So we will, we will uh, um, rework this language. It's probably too many changes to um, agree to this decision as orally amended. Do I have to gather? I see no objection on this. So let's proceed that way. Thank you. The meeting will now consider sub-item G3, entitled Other Matters Important for Achieving the Objectives and Purpose of the Treaty, such as Complementarity of the Treaty with the Existing Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Regime. Of Agenda Item 11, entitled Consideration of the Status and Operation of the Treaty and Other Matters Important for Achieving the Objectives and Purpose of the Treaty. Delegations have before them working paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 working paper 3 entitled Complementarity with the Existing Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Regime submitted by the co-facilitators Ireland and Thailand following consultations. Let me thank the two facilitators very much for their work uh, on this, uh, I think, excellent working paper uh, over many weeks and also to all delegations who actively contributed to the discussion and uh, to um, support uh, its content. And I now give the floor to um, Mr. Jamie Walsh uh, of Ireland to, sp to introduce the paper on behalf of the co-facilitators. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to briefly introduce the paper. And first, I'd like to thank all delegations for their active engagement and contributions to the extensive consultations that took place on this paper. As you say, uh, the final version of the paper was uploaded to the website and is available as Working Paper 3. Uh, as you noted, the paper on complementarity was jointly prepared by Ireland and Thailand. The content that in the paper emerged from discussions during the preparatory process and was informed by the negotiation of the TPNW itself. It's very encouraging, I have to say, that a large number of states' parties also made reference to the complementarity between the TPNW and other disarmament and non-proliferation instruments in their national statements at this meeting. I believe this is a testament to the dedication that all states' parties to the TPNW have for the disarmament and non-proliferation regime and their de desire to strengthen it. Since we've had exhaustive consultations on this paper already, I can be brief in introducing its provisions. 
Its primary purpose is to demonstrate that while the TPNW is a standalone, legally binding instrument, the treaty builds upon, contributes to, and complements a rich and diverse disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. The paper highlights those complementarities and sets out specific linkages between the TPNW and other disarmament and non-proliferation instruments, as well as attempting to highlight the TPNW's relevance to current nuclear disarmament debates. In setting out those linkages, the paper demonstrates how NPT states parties have, throughout the treaty's history, built a variety of supporting politically and legally binding frameworks around the NPT to bolster and help implement its provisions. It shows how, in the absence of an enabling legally binding framework, and given the slow pace of implementation of agreed disarmament commitments, the negotiation and adoption of the TPNW is a powerful and necessary contribution towards the full implementation of Article 6 of the NPT. The paper also emphasizes the positive contribution of the TPNW to existing disarmament norms and non-proliferation standards, as well as other relevant processes, such as the Humanitarian Consequences Initiative, which of course underpins the TPNW itself. The primary decision to be taken as a result of this paper is to appoint an informal facilitator or facilitators to further explore and articulate possible areas of tangible cooperation between the NPT and the TPNW and other relevant nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation instruments during the period between the first meeting of states parties and the second meeting of states parties. And that decision, as we heard, is already set out in CRP 6. There are also several actions related to complementarity set out in the draft Vienna Action Plan. These include encouraging states parties to emphasize the complementarity of the TPNW with the existing disarmament and non-proliferation regimes at appropriate opportunities, enhanced cooperation with other international bodies such as the IAEA and the CTBTO, including in the areas of nuclear safeguards and verification, and continuing to work together on outreach projects in order to raise awareness not only among governments but also with civil society, academia, parliamentarians and the general public, including youth organizations, on these elements of complementarity. Uh, very happy to answer any uh, outstanding questions on these elements that are in the paper or any of the actions related to complementarity in the action plan or the decision itself, Mr. Chair. I thank you. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Jamie Walsh uh, for uh, this introduction and again reiterate uh, uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, our gratitude for this, uh, for the work that went into preparing this paper. Um, I now give the floor to the delegation of the Philippines to be followed by Malaysia. Philippines, please. Thank you, Mr. President. The Philippines welcomes the working paper on complementarity put forward by Thailand and Ireland and endorses the recommendations contained therein. The principle of complementarity intends to fill in existing gaps in the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation architecture in line with our unequivocal commitment to a world without nuclear weapons. By closing these gaps, we diminish the justifications nuclear armed states use in maintaining these weapons. The TPNW does not supplant the instruments that have come before it, but rather advances their true spirit and objectives. In particular, we underscore the following four points. First, the TPNW complements and reinforces the NPT, which remains the cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. The TPNW provides the legal framework and provides concrete, actionable measures to implement Article 6 of the NPT, building upon the practical approaches in the 64-point action plan. Second, the TPNW reinforces the IAEA safeguard system. Non-nuclear weapon states shall continue implementing the existing safeguards obligations they have undertaken. However, nuclear armed states acceding to the TPNW have the moral and legal obligation to provide credible assurances that all their nuclear material, activities, and facilities shall remain exclusively under peaceful uses henceforth. Third, the TPNW advances the aspirations of the treaties establishing nuclear weapons free zones, including the Bangkok Treaty on the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone, by expanding their coverage to the rest of the world. 
And fourth, the TPNW strengthens the global norm against nuclear testing, building upon the accomplishments of the CTBT. The TPNW prohibits all forms of nuclear testing, explosive or otherwise, thereby cutting off opportunities for qualitative improvements in the design and fabrication of nuclear weapons and reducing the likelihood of their use. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank uh, Philippines for this intervention. And I give the floor to Malaysia to be followed by South, South Africa. Malaysia, please. Thank you, Mr. President. My delegation takes this opportunity to thank Ireland and Thailand for their hard work as the co-facilitators in the item. Like many others here, in addition to supporting the TPNW, we also remain firmly committed to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, NPT. We continue to believe that the NPT plays a vital role in promoting international peace and security and remains the cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. Both the TPNW and the NPT share the same ultimate goal, namely the abolition of nuclear weapons. The TPNW helps advance this goal by creating a legal framework that contributes towards the implementation of Article 6 of the NPT. The TPNW is also compatible with and complementary to the nuclear weapon free zones of Tataloko, Rarotonga, Pilindaba, Semi Palatings, and my region's very own Sean Fes, or the Bangkok Treaty. The Prohibition Treaty is fully in line with the provisions contained in these treaties to prohibit the use, testing, manufacture, production, acquisition, receipt, storage, installation, deployment, and possession of nuclear weapons. Malaysia will continue to work tirelessly in pursuit of the signing and early ratification by the nuclear weapon states of the protocol to the Sean Fest Treaty. In closing, Mr. President, my delegation reiterates our commitment and readiness to work through both the NPT and the TPNW towards the overarching goal of world free from nuclear weapons. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank, I thank Malaysia for this intervention. I give the floor to South Africa to be followed by Cuba. South Africa, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, we'd also uh, like to uh, thank uh, the co-facilitators, Thailand and Ireland, for the uh, work on the complementarity between the TPNW and the existing nuclear disarmament architecture. Uh, Mr. President, South Africa welcomes that the mandate of the informal facilitators uh, to further explore and articulate possible areas of tangible cooperation includes the NPT uh, as well as other relevant uh, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation instruments. We believe that this will truly enhance the work uh, we are undertaking in this intersessional period. I thank you. I thank South Africa for this intervention. Uh, Cuba, please, to be followed by Mexico. Thank you very much, President. We are grateful for the work carried out by Ireland and Thailand as facilitators of this working paper on complementarity. Cuba supports the enhancing of the work here in the TPNW, working together with other organizations in the uh, disarmament and non-proliferation architecture, such as the OAS and CTBTO. In addition to the identification and establishment of areas of common work with uh, the, nu the nuclear weapons free treaty areas, we support the establishment of an informal facilitator who would explore and coordinate areas of cooperation between the TPNW and the NPT, states' parties should use the intercessional period in order to identify all areas of convergence between the TPNW and the NPT, in particular in the context of Article C of the NPT. And the, TPN, the TPNW and the NPT does not contain a definition of nuclear weapons which leads to difficulties regarding the uh, legal definitions in both treaties. Given the positive obligations under the TPNU regarding victim assistance and environmental remediation, substantive progress can be achieved in discussions among parties to the NPT. 
since the eighth review conference in 2010. And then finally, we emphasize the fact that Cuba uh, does not support the uh, imposition of complementarity with the TPNW with um, initiatives that are not inclusive and which are being promoted outside of the United Nations, nor can we support complementarity with instruments of only limited composition with politically manipulated or man politically manipulated parameters. I think uh, Cuba. And I'll give the floor to Mexico to be followed by Thailand. Mexico, please. Thank you very much, President. The delegation of Mexico would like to thank the delegations of Ireland and Thailand for the presentation of the working paper on complementarity. My delegation wishes to recall that the International Court of Justice, in its advisory opinion of 1996, had indicated that there is an obligation to pursue in good faith and to bring to a conclusion negotiations with a view to achieving nuclear disarmament in all aspects under strict and effective international control. Mexico repeats that the TPNW is in keeping with the obligations set forth in Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and is equally complementary with the provisions contained in the uh, CTBT as well as with the treaties establishing nuclear weapons free zones. Thank you very much, President. I, th I think uh, Mexico, and I'll give the floor to Thailand. Thank you, Mr. President. As a co-facilitator of the working paper, Thailand wishes to thank Ireland, our co-facilitator, all parties involved, as well as Mr. President and the Secretariat for their invaluable inputs and support throughout the drafting process. Thailand is of the view that knowledge and understanding of concept of complementarity are key to the treaty's successful implementation and its universalization. While the TPNW is a standalone legally binding instrument, it is a part of the global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation architecture that should be driven in collaboration with one another. Every framework plays its unique but, con but crucial part in contributing to the grand vision of achieving the world without nuclear weapons. As emphasized in our working paper, the TPN Bro is based on its chair basis and objectives of, uh, with other frameworks towards nuclear disarmament particularly the NPT. By further strengthening nuclear disarmament norm and advancing international humanitarian law, the successful implementation of TP TPNW will also complement several disarmament-related instruments and initiatives, such as the entry into force of the CTBT, the negotiation of an FMCT stockpile reduction negotiations and nuclear risk reduction. Thailand sees the merit in planning our future work that is guided by the basis of TP Bro's complementarity with other frameworks. As outlined in the recommendation of the working paper, it is also apparent that cooperation with the international, international bodies such as the IAEA and the CTBTO is important especially in the area of nuclear safeguards and verification. Not only will it reaffirm the complementarity of the TP and the BRO, but it will also increase the visibility of the treaty in various international fora. We believe in the strength of cooperation and positive contribution that the treaty can provide to other frameworks. Therefore, we encourage other state parties, signatory states, an observer to promote the complementarity aspects of the TP and the Bro in other relevant treaties, framework, and platforms. On our part, Thailand has been consistent in promoting awareness on the TP and the Bro's con constructive contribution in various international frameworks, such as in the IAEA, the CTBTO, as well as regional platforms like the ASEAN Regional Forum. We are committed to doing more and we'll, we will continue to do so until the misinformation and accusation against the treaty has been eradicated 
and all states are on the right side of the history. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank uh, uh, Thailand for this uh, statement. Once again, reiterate our gratitude uh, for the uh, work uh, done as facilitators and also for your readiness to continue um, this work uh, um, in the future. I now give the floor to Kazakhstan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, out, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Ireland and Thailand for uh, their role as uh, co-facilitators of, of the process on, on complementarity. Uh, Mr. President, almost five years after the TPNW adoption, we now find ourselves at the next milestone in the evolution of the treaty. Despite continuing criticism and attempts to dismiss the hi historical and political uh, significance of the TPNW, we can say that without exaggeration, this treaty has solidified itself in the broader disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. As the political process matures, it is critical that the treaty remains complementary to all existing disarmament and non-proliferation instruments but first and foremost, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. While many nuclear possessing countries and others seeking protection from them may be opposed to the TPNW, they do realize that the treaty has a broader commitment to global nuclear disarmament. Furthermore, several countries argue that the security conditions are not conducive for nuclear disarmament because of threats posed by several countries. To them, we say that security conditions will never be wholly favorable for nuclear disarmament. Instead, progress in disarmament can itself create better security conditions and thus should be pursued. Therefore, the NPT should be reinforced by the TPNW, which can have much value as a moral compass. It can have an indirect influence on the future path of nuclear disarmament. In this vein, we join others in reiterating the collective firm conviction that both the TPNW and the NPT are mutually compatible and re reinforcing particularly through Article 6 of the latter. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Kazakhstan for this statement. I now give the floor to ICANN to be followed by the ICRC. ICANN, please. Gracias, señor Presidente. Thank you very much, Chair for allowing us to comment on the complementarity of the TPNW with the existing disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation regime. And I'm speaking on behalf of the CELAC ICANN network. We wish to underscore that the TPNW is perfectly uh, in keeping with the nuclear disarmament architecture, and it is the first instrument that, express, that ex expresses um, an explicit elimination request. In the TPNW, it recalls the contributions made by the NP2, given that this is considered the cornerstone of the disarmament and non-proliferation regime. At the same time, it recognizes the vital importance of the CTBT. As has been expressed by states' parties in their statements during the general exchange and also at this session, it is equally compatible with broader arrangements under the United Nations, such as the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, set forth in a number of fundamental agreements, which are equally legally binding. The TPNW was negotiated by states entirely committed to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as well as to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It complements and supplements the NPT in many ways, strengthening the safeguards regime and, above all, strengthening the implementation of Article 6. As regards the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, it further strengthens this and creates positive obligations for victims of such tests. Moreover, as is set forth in the preamble, it is based on the treaty establishing nuclear weapons free zones, including the Treaty of Tlatelolco, which was the first to have been adopted even prior to the NPT, and which contains a specific provision in the Latin American Caribbean region, my region, related to the development, acquisition, and placement of weapons. 
where no question regarding complementarity had ever been raised, and the Secretariat of Cop Opanal is an example in this case. Equally, this applies to the Treaty of Pelindaba, of semi palatinx of uh, Central Asia, the Bangkok Treaty for South Asia, and the Treaty of Rarotonga, and other nuclear weapon-free zones. The TPNW will help transform regional standards and norms into international norms and standards. It equally addresses the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which will not be achieved or attained as long as nuclear weapons exist and as long as there is the risk of their use. It is important to recall the following, and we are grateful for the proposals made set forth in the working paper on complementarity. Nuclear weapons are incompatible with international law in the broader sense, including with international humanitarian law as well as international human rights law. The TPNW is fundamental in serving to achieve disarmament. It is a key step forward in achieving the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you. I thank ICANN for this statement. I now give the floor to the ICRC. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There have been calls for the elimination of nuclear weapons since they were first developed. In 1946, the very first resolution of the United Nations General Assembly sought to urgently identify pathways to eliminate atomic weapons. Today, a nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation framework is in place, of which the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons is a cornerstone. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and regional treaties establishing nuclear weapons free zones, among other instruments, are building blocks of this framework. The DPNW itself is part of this broader architecture. It does not supersede or replace these instruments, but rather complements and strengthens them. The NPT sets the goal of the eliminations of nuclear weapons and it establishes an obligation to pursue multilateral negotiations on effective measures leading to nuclear disarmament. The TPNW is a concrete step towards fulfilling existing nuclear disarmament obligations and commitments, in particular those under Article 6 of the NPT. The TPNW advances the aim of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation non architecture and complements and strengthen it in multiple ways. I will mention five of them. First, the TPNW comprehensively prohibits nuclear weapons, which as we have seen with other weapons of mass destruction is an essential step towards their elimination. Second, the TPNW strengthens the taboo against the use of nuclear weapons thus providing a further disincentive for their proliferation, which is one of the main objectives of the NPT. Third, the TPNW establishes a number of additional obligations in line with the ultimate goal of nuclear disarmament, such as the prohibition on the threat of use, possessions, and stationing of nuclear weapons on a state party's territory. Fourth, the TPNW provides pathways for future measures to achieve nuclear disarmament and its verification. And last but not least, it introduces positive obligations that are novel in the field of nuclear disarmament. By setting out obligations relating to assistance for victims of nuclear weapons use and testing, and for the remediations of contaminated area, the treaty recognizes state's duty to care for all life harmed by these weapons. The TPNW is a major step forward towards a world free from nuclear weapons, but nuclear disarmament remains a work in progress. In this regard, I'm glad to share with this MSP distinguished delegations that the Council of Delegates of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement adopted yesterday a resolution and an ambitious multi-year plan of actions entitled Working Towards the Eliminations of Nuclear Weapons. Mr. President, the ICRC welcomes references to the complementarity of the TPNW with the NPT and the Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaties in the draft political declarations. And we welcome also 
actions 33 to 36 of the draft action plan based on the excellent working paper facilitated by Ireland and Thailand. In particular, we strongly support the decision of the meeting of state parties to appoint an informal facilitator to further explore and articulate the possible areas of tangible cooperation between the TPNW and the NPT during the intersessional period. In the ICRC's view, such cooperation is very important in furthering the objectives of both treaties. In the two working papers that we submitted to this meeting and to the 10th NPT review conference, we recommend that state parties explore, develop, and promote complementarity and synergies between the two instruments, including in respect of the obligations related to victim assistance and environmental remediations. To conclude, in its first preambular paragraph, the NPT acknowledges, I quote, the devastation that would be visited upon all mankind by a nuclear war and the consequent need to make every effort to avert the danger of such a war, end quote. As we have said before, nuclear disarmament is a common interest and a common responsibility and we owe it to future generations to work towards, to, to work together to make a world free from nuclear weapons a reality. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the ICRC. Uh, I now give the floor to Peru. Muchas gracias, señor. Thank you very much, President. We too would echo the general gratitude expressed to uh, Ireland and Thailand for the very positive result achieved in the presentation of this document referring to this important issue of complementarity between the TPNW and the NPT, essentially. We agree with all delegations and that the NPT is the cornerstone upon which the multilateral new disarmament uh, architecture reposes. We would like to use this opportunity to echo what we said in our first statement at the session, simply to restate that the TPNW will complement the NPT. The structure of the TPNW provides a broader framework for the provision of assistance among states' parties in order to help fulfill their obligations as well as to ensure protection. Protection is provided to victims of attacks or the victims of nuclear tests. All of this in strict compliance with international humanitarian law. And therefore, we believe that this element of complementarity, which is necessarily linked to the humanitarian nature of this instrument, provides significant added value to the TPNW as such. It lends it further strength, greater strength, in helping to fuel some optimism, perhaps, as regards the viability of this future treaty. In recent days, we have placed emphasis on the issue of its universalization, and this is a process which will take time. We welcome what has been said by a number of countries regarding the processes that they have embarked on in their national legislation in order to ultimately ratify this treaty and submit their instruments of ratification. But at the same time, in parallel, we believe that this humanitarian feature or aspect will help add impetus to this process that we are all greatly committed to, that we are all engaged in in helping to drive forward the general process that should lead us to the final aim, which is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. We hope that the further strengthening of the humanitarian factor will serve to breathe fresh life into the process overall, in particular as regards disarmament, and as was said yesterday, a process that has been stagnating for quite some time. And that is a further goal that we should pursue. That's all. Thank you very much. Once again, we commend and thank the two delegations and e 
finally wish to echo the very uh, salient comments made by the delegation of Mexico. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the delegation of Peru. I have uh, no further requests for the floor. Section 2K of the conference paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP6 entitled Decisions to be Taken by the First Meeting of States Parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons contains a draft decision regarding this agenda item. I've also been informed that Thailand is also ready to serve as informal facilitator on this issue, which we've already uh, mentioned and uh, uh, very much welcome. I therefore propose to amend the text of Section 2K to appoint Ireland and Thailand as informal facilitators and to make the necessary grammatical changes throughout the document. May I take it it's the wish of the meeting to adopt draft decision contained in section 2K of conference paper TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash CRP6 as orally amended. I see no objection. It is so decided. I think that's worth a round of applause. <laughs> First, I would like to congratulate Ireland and Thailand uh, on their appointment as facilitators on this issue. And let me just say that um, I think, assuming to speak on behalf of, uh, of the meeting, that it is extremely important that this meeting sends a crystal clear, unequivocal message regarding the complementarity of the TPNW with the existing regime and the NPT in particular, given some unfortunate uh, points that uh, have been made and continue to be made, this is very important. I think we have just sent this very clear message. I think it's really excellent and an extremely positive step. So um, thank you all. May I take it it's the wish of the meeting to conclude consideration of sub-item G3 of agenda item 11 and of agenda item 11 as a whole? I see no objection. It is so decided. We will resume consideration of item 8 entitled organization of work. Still time? Yeah. Given the time remaining in this morning's meetings, I propose that notwithstanding the program of work contained in document in 3, the meeting proceed immediately to consider agenda item 12. 12. I see no objection. So decided. The meeting has thus concluded this stage of consideration of agenda item 8. Item 12 is financial matters. So the meeting will now consider this item. Delegations have before them the financial report issues this document TPNW slash MSP slash 2022 slash 2. May I take it that it's the wish of the meeting to take note of the financial report? I see no objection. It is so decided. Thank you. I appeal to all states, parties, and observer states that have not yet done so to pay their assessed contributions as soon as possible. In addition, the meeting will recall that through silence procedure that expired on 18 March 2022 without objections, states, parties, and I quote, decided to apply a maximum assessed rate of 22% of the total costs to contributions to the first meeting of states parties without prejudice to assessed contributions for future meeting of states parties and decided to review the question of the maximum assessment rate ahead of the second meeting of states parties, end of quote. May I take it that it's the wish of the meeting to take note of this intersessional decision? I see no objection. 
it is so decided. May I take it, it's the wish of the meeting to conclude its consideration of item 12? It is so decided. With this, uh, I would like to conclude the business of this morning's meeting. The sixth and final plenary meeting will take place in this hall promptly at three. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Okay.